Okay, good evening everyone. I'm amazed that orthopedic surgeons uh, and postgraduates are able to sit so long and listen to what is being going on. And thanks to Manish for that. Uh, he's done a marvelous job. And thank you all the speakers. I think uh, most of my job of uh, evaluation has been done. Uh, now let me go straight to some uh, clinical pictures. Uh, uh, who gets a lumbar disc prolapse? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You are clearly audible. Yes, okay. yes, sir. Who gets a lumbar disc prolapse? Everyone in his lifetime will suffer from low back pain at least once in his lifetime. And the prevalence is about 80 to 90%. And about 10 to 25 of these will become persistent and chronic. However, the good news is that most of these back pains that occur in 80 to 90% of the population resolve over a period of time with conservative management. Most of the lumbar disc herniations occur at L4-5 and L5-S1. Disc prolapse that occur above L3 is called high lumbar disc and it is important to know that because they behave differently and the risk of corda is higher in them though the commonest site of corda equina is L4-5. How do I go forward? Okay, it can happen without any physical exertion. How does a disc prolapse occur in common person? Mm -hmm. It can happen without any physical exertion also. Suddenly you wake up and you find your back stiff and then you start getting some buttock pain and leg pain. But usually happens after a physical exertion jerk or heavy lifting. Pain typically occurs in the back and radius to the buttock as has already been said in the examination and goes down to the thighs, legs and toes depending on the level disc affected and the nerve affected. This is called radicular pain and may have numbness, paresthesia, weakness associated with it. So normally a normal disc is confined to its normal anatomy. So it stays, it, is, it, is, it has an annulus fibrosis and a nucleus pulposus. So annulus fibrosus is like a tire with about 20 layers, each layer obliquing itself at about 110 degrees attached to the bone above and below, vertebral end plate. And the nucleus pulposus is jelly-like substance as we know, uh, rich in hyaluronic acid and chondroitin sulfate and is, uh, absorbs water uh, during the night and when you walk, wake up in the morning, you're normally taller at the end of the day. Really, uh, so that's why you get more back pain, uh, leg pain and back pain when you wake up with a disc prolapse in the morning. And any bulge from that is called a diffuse disc bulge. Whether it could be symmetric and causing foraminal stenosis or it could be asymmetric. When the annulus fibrosis ruptures or starts rupturing of as many layers by crevices then it is called protrusion when the nucleus comes out. When the nucleus comes out more and the thin layer of annulus is surrounding, but it is attached to the parent nucleus, it is called an extrusion. And when it is separate, it is called a sequestration or a sequestrum. So it has no connection with the parent disc. So where does the disc prolapse? That also is very important. A central disc herniation can compress many roots. And so it can have a mixed picture. However, most of the disc prolapse occurs in the posterolateral region or in the foramen or extra foraminal region. So that also is very important to know where the disc prolapse. And clinical history and examination can tell you a lot of these things which Sumit and, uh, and Dr. Sudhir Kapoor have explained so well. So you can have a central disc prolapse, you can have a posterolateral disc prolapse, you can have a foramen disc prolapse or a subarticular disc prolapse or you can have an extra foraminal because this is a cylindrical uh, disc is cylindrical. So it can, this can prolapse anywhere. It can also prolapse anteriorly, but normally is asymptomatic. So this is also very important for postgraduates to know that in addition to the place where disc prolapses, it can go up or down. So if it goes down to the pedicle, it can be along the pedicle and in the subarticular region, it can go up into the vertebral body. So it can migrate, if it is sequestrated or protruded with a bulge, it can migrate up and down. And this is a picture, very good picture from McNabb, who's written a long ago, a book on low back pain. And I find this very useful. And he's divided the lumbar vertebra and the disc as an American uh, into 
first floor, second floor, and third floor. So you must know which floor is the disc in, and which part of the vertebral body the disc is, whether it is central, subarticular, or foraminal, or extra foraminal. And that is important to understand from clinical history, examination, and MRI. So you should be able to read the MRI. As soon as you become orthopedic surgeons, you will see start seeing spine patients, and more spine patients are seen by orthopedic surgeons than spine surgeons. Things also you must know is small to moderate central disc prolapse or annular bulge may present only with back pain. So they may not have leg pain or buttock pain and so you may be taken off guard. So it is important that bulges or small central disc prolapse may have back pain. Lateral and extra foraminal disc prolapse will mainly have leg pain and no back pain because it is on the foramen. So they usually press on the exiting nerve root and the traversing nerve root escapes. So they have only leg pain and that is important to know, which is the exiting nerve root and which is the traversing nerve root. Usually, posterolateral disc cord touch the traversing nerve root. So, the exiting nerve root escapes in that. High lumbar disc, as I said earlier, may have mixed symptoms because they affect multiple roots and you must be aware of that. So, a very good history taking and clinical examination, you will be able to differentiate mentally as to where is the disc prolapse. And then you correlate your findings by examination and then by your MRI findings. So this has all been told by three speakers earlier that in the front, in the groin area, you have the L1, in the front of the thigh is L3, uh, knee and medial aspect of the leg uh, is L4, outer aspect of the leg is L5, and the back and the heel and the back of the calf is S1. You stand on S1 and you sit on S2 and 3. And a quick, uh, cl uh, quick uh, clinical examination is in the clinic, I can just tell you that you can, if you stand on your tiptoes, you are standing on your S1. If you're standing on your heel, you are standing on your L5. If you, if you can uh, uh, sit down and get up, your L4 is all right. And once you can sit down and sit crossed like your hip and knee mostly are all right. So this is a quick cursory clinical examination in a uh, in, in a clinic or in an examination hall. L4 typically is tibialis anterior, so you can ask them to do, do dorsiflexion and inversion. So these are tricks you must know, and you must also know special dermatomal areas where it's specific for L5, for example, the web between the first and the second term. I think Sumit has already shown you what, uh, what he meant by a shoulder presentation and an axillary presentation, and it is important that you should, from the list, and the side where the leg buttock paining, you will be able to mentally perceive which side, which whether it's an axillary or a shoulder presentation. But sometimes this may not be accurate. Examination of hip and knee is very, very important. A detailed neurological exam is essential. We've gone great lengths that also peripheral pulses should not be ruled, should always be checked. So don't, just don't jump to see an MRI and then make a diagnosis without checking the peripheral pulses. I have seen so many mistakes and surgery done without uh, uh, doing peripheral pulses and patient being in trouble. So that is also important. We have already spoken about the femoral uh, uh, straight leg raise test and the femoral stretch test. So I will not spend much time on it. You already know what this test is. What is important is why is the Bagard sign uh, 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 described is that when you stretch it when at over 75, you can get pain from the sacroiliac joint or from a hamstring stretch. That can also give you pain. So that may confuse you. So you lower the leg down a little bit when there is no more pain. And then you dorsiflex the foot. And that will tell you a sciatic stretch, which is stretching over the disc if it is inflamed. And to confirm it, you do the bowstring test, which I think Sumit explained to you very well. Then you press on the nerve and that also gives you pain. So you're confirmed of it. And that's why the important of this test. The femoral stretches or stress test has also been de described. And so this is important mentally to memorize as Professor Sudhir Kapoor said, what is what, sir. And that I explained to you how to quickly examine this. I will spend a couple of minutes on corda equina. This is our only medical um, uh, surgical emergency and it is important to know what is corda equina. L1, at L1, you have the conus and below that you have the corda, which means corda means a horse's tail. So it means all the nerve roots are coming out there and a large disc prolapse centrally. 
can cause compression of all the nerves. And the biggest problem is it can involve bowel and bladder dysfunction. So for, to say that the person has cauda equina, he must usually have a saddle anesthesia, bowel bladder dysfunction, and variable sensory and motor function. And they don't follow a fixed pattern. So that is important to know. So they basically have bilateral saddle anesthesia, bilateral posterior buttock and thigh and leg numbness and weakness with differential weakness of the legs, atrophy of the calves if it is long standing. So this is a only surgical emergency. So as soon as possible, you should operate. And that is important. And because this may present anywhere in the country and you may not get as orthopedic surgeons once you pass, you may have to know how to handle a corda equina and operate on that. What are the investigations have already been said, but for a, diagnosing a lumbar disc prolapse, MRI is probably the investigation of choice. However, X-ray is very important, especially when you decide to do an operation because level sacralization, lumbarization, four lumbar vertebra, five lumbar vertebra, and all that can be confusing. And so the commonest mistake if people do while doing surgery is if they have not checked with an X-ray and the MRI, the level is the wrong level surgery. So the commonest mistake in lumbar spine surgery is wrong level surgery. So you, we always check the levels one, not once, but twice or thrice. Sometimes subtle lysis, spondylolysis may be missed. And so CT scan is very important. Facet cyst, facet arthropathies may also co coexist with a disc prolapse in slightly middle age. So that is also important but not always. So essentially are your blood test, your MRI and an X-ray. For patients with multiple comorbid situations like diabetes, neuropathy, EMG and nerve conduction studies are required because suddenly you find a patient with a complete foot drop but with not some major compression and you get worried. So you, or sometimes you have a moderate compression and you may want to do a surgery but you basically the patient is a a diabetic neuropathy. So essentially, when you have coexisting diseases, it's very important to get EMG and nerve conduction test. And that is to be kept in mind. So once you have made your diagnosis, at this point, I must say that when you are diagnosing disc prolapse, I have not put that slide, but it's very important that you must eliminate other diagnosis, which can mimic disc prolapse. A pelvic inflammatory disease can mimic disc prolapse. Sacroiliitis or inflammatory arthropathy can uh, mimic disc prolapse. Even prostatitis or prostate problems can mimic disc prolapse. Abdominal aneurysm can do that. Abdominal problems can do that. So many conditions can mimic. So you must do a thorough examination. It, it is very, very important and take a proper history. Once you have made up your mind that this patient has got disc prolapse and no other problems, what is the treatment plan? Most 90% of the disc prolapse, he resolved with conservative treatment, mainly with analgesic, some anti-inflammatory, and at best, very rare cases, you may give them a short course of steroid for two to three days. Bed rest is only for pain relief, so there is no role of major bed rest. As soon as he can get up and walking, I allow my patients to walk. Once the pain is resolved, then you start focusing on a long-term rehabilitation, so physical therapy is very important. So let us look at this disc prolapse because when you graduate and become consultants at different places in the country, suddenly uh, you get an MRI with a large disc prolapse like this. And I have seen a lot of times patients getting operated for large disc prolapse because it occupies almost 80% of the canal. So it is very important to know that sequestrated disc normally resorb because of macrophages, phagocytes and things like that. So they resolve over a core period of time. And you can see these two MRIs on presentation and 10 months later, the disc has completely dissolved. So most of the disc prolapse resolve and size does not matter. Here's one thing here. And this very good paper, which has been published recently, it says the percentage of spinal canal occupied by herniated disc does not predict which patients will fail non-operative treatment and require surgery. In this, the exclusion criteria, they've excluded corda equina and hard disc and other things. But basically, if you have a large soft disc at L4, 5, L5, S1, and he has minimum, no more motor deficit or neurological deficit, no bowel bladder symptoms, you can treat him conservatively. And most of them will resolve about six to eight weeks time. 
Any other role of conservative treatment? Traction has no proven benefit. There is no class evidence. And uh, bracing is also not beneficial, but helpful in patients because it gives them some comfort of support. Now, epidural steroids are very commonly used in my, since my early post-graduation days in South Dajang. I have seen caudal epidural being given in bulk. However, caudal epidural as a route for giving steroids has gradually gone off. And nowadays, we either give an interlaminar approach or a transforaminal approach, which is more specific and better and has got better outcome and more predictable. You can exactly see localize where your uh, uh, needle is and you can check with the dye and then you get the injection and they gave a very good result. I use, I, in my unit, we do a lot of these blocks ourselves and they give good results. So if a patient is being treated by you for conservative disc prolapse, how long do you wait? Essentially, if you wait too long, the nerve gets memory, gets scarred, so you, and the uh, patient is symptomatic, especially if a foraminal or extra foraminal disc. And so it, it, you don't get a very good outcome. So essentially, waiting for beyond 8 to 12 weeks is not beneficial. So if you patient is not getting better by about 12 weeks, that is three months, then it is advisable to go for surgery. Normally, patients don't wait that long, but you can wait as long as the patient has no deficit or problem. So what are the indications for surgery? I just told you 90-95% of disc prolapse resolve with conservative treatment. So what are the indications for surgery? So there are only three indications for surgery. Corda equina, progressive motor loss, and intractable pain where the patient wants that he can't live like this anymore and he wants surgery for better quality of life. Microdiscectomy still remains the gold standard and all the other newer methods of discectomy are comparable to microdiscectomy. So still, this is a gold standard. And if you can do a good microdiscectomy well, I think you are fine in treating the patients effectively because you should not do any harm. And the complication rate of dural tears, discitis, or root injuries with the microdiscectomy is less than 2%. So let me take you with some schematic diagrams because I thought time doesn't allow us. So you give, give an incision between the two spinous process. You give a midline incision. Lumbar fascia, you can go slightly off midline and you can see uh, then you have the multifidus muscle and the multifidus muscle attachment as I have shown is there. So you erase the multifidus muscle with your cautery and then you will have to nibble it uh, with your kerosene ronger or a bird. So once you nibble it, you have this much area exposed. The ligamentum flavum is attached slightly higher up on the under surface of the lamina at the higher vertebral uh, lamina. While in the lower lamina, uh, superior margin of the lower lamina, it is attached. So if you put your kerosene ronger inadvertently lower, you may damage the dura and cause a dural leak. While you are much safer by putting the kerosene ronger superiorly, as you can see in the diagram. So once you have removed with the kerosene, you will have the ligamentum flavor. So the, uh, so the ligamentum flavum is attached higher up in the bone in the lamina above and on the margin in the lamina. So this is one safe area uh, where you can start removing the lamina or you can incise the lamina. There are many ways. You can keep the lamina, take a fold up, whatever you want to do, but you have to remove, uh, uh, raise the lamina. And once you raise the lamina, you will see what, uh, where the disc prolapse is at the level of L5-S1, the disc prolapse is at the level of the foramen, in the window, the foraminal window. As you grow higher, higher up, <coughs> excuse me, higher up, you have to cut more and more lamina. At L2-3, you may have to do an uh, hemilaminectomy as well. So this is a prolapsed disc. If it is on the sh shoulder, you can easily take it out. If it is in the axilla and it is very tight, then you may have to tease it out of the axilla. So this is how what disc prolapse is done. And then usually it's about one, 1.5 centimeters incision. So there are, as I said, there are various um, uh, types of disc prolapses and I can't go into the de details because Manish wants to teach the whole of spine surgery in two hours, which is impossible. So essentially in a sequestrectomy, we do a word which is called removal of the sequestrum which essentially means we remove the free fragment and we go through the tiny hole or the tear that is there in the annulus 
and with the two millimeter kerosene uh, pituitary, we take out whatever free fragment is there. So that is called a minimal sequestrectomy with removal of free fragments. However, when you have a corda equina which is occupying the whole of the canal, you will have to do an aggressive discectomy. So if you do an aggressive discectomy, then you will end up with more back pain. But sometimes you have to do that and it is important to counsel this patient. For example, this patient, you find that patient has three disc prolapse with a large uh, disc prolapse leading to corda equina. And this patient may have higher incidence of back pain. And if I do a sequestrectomy with just removal of the free fragment, I may have a higher incidence of recurrent disc. So this is a trade-off. And once with experience, you know how much to do and how much is enough. And that comes with only experience. There are lot, lots of complications so with the uh, discectomy. This is the simplest operation and yet the most complicated. And it can take 20 minutes to multiple hours. And sometimes you may come up, come up after a surgery, which has happened with me so many times, where I'm not happy with what I have done. So it is very important to plan your case very well and know what you're doing. So don't take these cases lightly. You can have vascular injury, and there are reports that the patient, uh, where surgeon has gone far anterior and nibbled onto the abdominal aorta and caused vascular injury. Nerve root injury is fairly common. Dural tear is also common. Infection, of, obviously, you can have infective discitis, post-op discitis, and that's a nightmare. If you get infection in spine, it is a big nightmare. You are in other matter, if you get infection in spine or joints, it's a big problem. So we are very, very careful. Back pain increases if you get do in an aggressive discectomy. Recurrent disc herniation occurs about 6%, 4 to 6% in normal population. In diabetics, it is more. In smokers, it is more. And obviously, it, the amount of discectomy you do, it depends. And the amount of annular tears. I'll tell you a bit about annular tear, but there's not much time. So if you have a large annular tear or a defect, then the recurrent disc herniation chance is more. If you have a very small uh, annular tear, the chance is less. Corda equina is a big problem, and then there are medical complications. One little, uh, one, two slides on what are the types of disc. Mentally, everybody would think that the disc prolapses when the annulus gives way. Yes, about 50% of disc prolapses when the annulus gives way. And the annulus can have a small hole, may have no hole, or may have a large hole or may have a large tear. So depending on that, the outcome has also been described by this very good study, which is quoted most of the time, Eugene Kariji et al. And it tells us that uh, which this prolapse in which type will do well. Also, I would suggest all postgraduates to read this landmark paper from Dr. Raj Shekhar and Ajay Shetty and Rishi, which, say, which did a very good study because MRI does not show the bone end plate well. An X-ray also does not show the bone end plate very well. And they found out that about 50 to 60% of disc prolapse occurs because of end plate fracture or rim failure. And 50% occurs because of annular failure. Until date, we always knew that disc prolapse occurs because of annular failure. And this is an important thing to keep in mind because you must know all the things that are happening with this study. So the take-home message is history and clinical examination is very, very important in making a diagnosis. And I think must thank Manish for giving three lectures for only history taking and clinical examination. We have had a special class on MRI and how to read an MRI and x-rays. Most of the disc prolapse are treated conservatively. Only absolute indication is corda equina or increasing neurological deficit or intractable pain. Microscopic discectomy remains the gold standard procedure. There are many more methods of taking the disc out as endoscopic, interlaminar, transforaminal, and more, more minimally invasive procedures. But these three are more popular. And if you can learn these, well, you can give a better outcome with lesser complications. But it has a longer learning curve. And you must be able, aware of the complications and recognize them. And I thank everyone for giving me this time. I got this slide from Dr. Raj Shekhar and he says, stay positive uh, and test negative in this time of Corona crisis, where thank there's you. so much of academics and no clinical work. Thank you, Manish. Thank you. Thank you.